I'll, I'll just um, yeah I think we're good good morning everybody if people could grab a seat welcome hopefully people enjoyed the conference dinner last night and are feeling refreshed and well rested from some excellent socializing um, my name is Alison Ritter. I'm the director of the Drug Policy Modelling Program at the University of New South Wales. And I'll let Dave introduce himself. Hi, morning everyone. I'm Dave Little, the CEO of Scottish Drugs Forum, based here in Glasgow. And we're both delighted to be chairing this session this morning. It's in three parts. The first part is some awards, followed by two keynote presentations, and then two other papers selected from the abstract submission process. Before we kick off, can we please thank our gold sponsors, Gilead and silver sponsor, Abvi. The poster tours are on at 11 a.m. Um, today. And as all good conferences require, there will be an evaluation. Um, and you'll be sent something in the coming week, and we'd really appreciate it if you completed it, because it will drive what happens next year, which I believe is being held in Geneva, which is very exciting. So thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Annie Madden. Annie is a, a colleague of mine. She's a project lead for INPUD. She's the executive, one of the executive directors of Harm Reduction Australia, well known to all of us. And Annie's going to introduce the Jude Byrne Emerging Female Leader Award. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Alison. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you for attending this morning after a hard night on the Institute dance floor, I'm, I'm sure, for many of you. Um, my name is Annie Madden, as Alison has said, and it is my absolute privilege to be here today to speak about and to introduce our winners um, of the 2022 Jude Byrne Emerging Female Leaders Award. Um, Jude, I'm going to speak a little bit first about who Jude um, is to all of us, and then a little bit about the award, and then introduce our winners for this year, our inaugural winners. So uh, Jude Byrne will be known to many of you, I'm sure, um, but some of you may not know Jude so well. So Jude um, was, uh, oh gosh, Jude was a um, really legendary um, Australian drug user activist, and, and also a global, a legendary global drug user activist as well, and so much more besides. Some days I can talk about this better than others. <laughs> um, so Jube was my colleague and co-worker, my friend, and also my own mentor. Um, I worked with Jude for over 30 years in Australia in the drug users movement. And uh, sadly, Jude passed away quite unexpectedly, really, in March um, 2021. And uh, those of Jude, at the time of Jude passing, um, she was uh, on the INSU board, and she had also been involved in input, instrumental in establishing input as an international drug users. Uh, network and organization and establishing it to become the organization that it is today and she was chair of input until 2015. So when Jude passed away, INSU and input came together to agree that it was really important to acknowledge her decades of work on behalf of people who use drugs um, and to uh, do that with an award in her honor and in her name. Uh, we decided to focus the award on emerging female leaders, in large part because, not only because Jude was a feminist, but because Jude was one of the people who, in, to my mind, was one of the first women drug user activists who really put women drug users at the forefront of what she was doing and talking about, and in the late, sort of mid 80s, late 80s, she in Australia, she was leading some of the most innovative uh, programs, 
not just for women who use drugs, but in particular for women who use drugs who had children. And that is a particularly stigmatizing space to be as a person. Um, those of you who are or have been drug users, female drug users with children will know very well how difficult that space is to be in. So she was a real champion of that, and so that was a real lead for us to, to focus this award in her name on emerging female leaders in the global drug users movement. So um, I don't have a lot of time, so I think I'll move on to introducing, <laughs> um, I think we're already running a little behind when we started, so to introducing our, as I say, inaugural winners. This is the first year of the award. We hope to make this award ongoing, um, but this is our first, first year, and we had an enormous response to the award. Um, it was amazing, lots of applications. It was a highly competitive process. We had a panel of five women who knew Jude and worked with Jude, very well, who came together to assess the applications. We whittled those applications down. It was very difficult to a, a kind of list of top five. And then from there, we asked people to submit a short video to um, accompany their application. Some people were nominated by others and some put themselves forward. You could do either. And then from those videos, we then selected our two recipients. So um, our two recipients for 2022 is, uh, they are Yati Jone from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and Danielle Russell from Phoenix, Arizona in the US. Both, we're very lucky and fortunate to have both of these amazing young women with us here today. And they are both going to speak to you about the award, winning it, what it means for them and what it's, what it's meant for them as drug user activists. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Yati Jone to come and speak to you. Please welcome her. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Please bear in mind, I, I'm quite nervous. No, too nervous. Um, I would like to thank the organizers to finally taking myself to find, having here uh, speaking on behalf of my community in my region. Being the only Malaysian here is quite sad, but I know um, there will be chances that Insu will come to Malaysia, hopefully. Uh, I will talk about myself a bit and also uh, what am I going to do with what in the future. I'm coming from a background as a, an active drug user, a mother, a sister, being incarcerated in prison for two times, compulsory detention centers for two times, where I am and we are living in a suppressive environment. Consuming drugs can lead us to prison or detention centers. But it doesn't stop me because I know we as a drug user has our right to live as other people. So with the small, small funding that I get uh, for the past three years, I'm focusing on empowering women who use drugs, transgender who use drugs, spouses of people who use drugs, children of people who use drugs, and also young people who use drugs. Um, in, with a small team that I affiliated with, we managed to do the needs assessment among them, and it's, the finding is quite devastating. The award is really, and I, I really does, didn't expect that I will get the award because I didn't personally apply it myself. I just share it among my network in my country, and I, I don't know what was written from their side. And being the top five, I submitted um, a hum my humble short video to talk about my situation and what can I do if I get the, uh, the award. And that's why I'm saying that nothing can stop me from what I'm doing 
with what I have, I will take the lead to become a peer researcher in my country, to do my own research, to get data among the small population that I'm talking about, to present it to the highest stakeholders in my country towards drug policy reform uh, uh, to, find, to, to finally get our punitive drug policy to be reformed. I'm as a, as a harm reductionist in my country um, and the only one woman to be open and bold about my drug use. One of my feet is inside the prison already and another one is outside. Imagine living like that, the environment like that. Um, it, it's hard, it's not easy, but I don't care. I don't have nothing to hold me back because I have the right support. I have the right, uh, I have the right support that keeps me alive and they believe what, in what I'm doing, not just locally from my country, I have all the support from my regional network and also international network. I really, I really want to thank everyone who, who, who has been, who always been there whenever I need, who has, who believe in what I'm doing. Um, I really hope that all of you can say a bit of prayer to me, for me to be able to continue what I want, uh, the work that I do, that will benefit the community back in my country. Um, I think, yeah, that's all about uh, myself. Thanks for the, for the award, actually, yeah. And now, thank you, Yati, that was amazing. Um, you're amazing. So, um, next, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Danielle Russell. Danielle, as I said, is from Phoenix, Arizona in the United States, and uh, she is our second recipient for the Jude Byrne Emerging Female Leader Award. Please make her welcome. Hello. Um, I just wanted to say I'm humbled and grateful to have received this award. Um, it's been one of the things that I said that I was looking forward to do uh, if I was able to you know, get this award and this mentorship is to be able to uh, kind of break out of the local silo that I exist in in Arizona because you don't know what you don't know and uh, pretty much all of my activism and advocacy has been very local. Um, but since I've won this award, I've traveled to Sydney, um, and I spoke at a forum there. I'm really getting my, uh, like, spreading my wings as far as public speaking goes. It was a big fear of mine. It still is. Um, but yeah, I guess I should have introduced myself as well. I'm Danielle Russell. I'm a PhD student um, at Arizona State University. Uh, I should be defending my dissertation next spring and graduating. Um, I'm also an injection drug user, a person on methadone. I say, I never say patient on methadone because I feel more like a prisoner than a patient. But um, uh, so that's a little bit about me. <laughs> yeah, no, they, they've allowed me to come here, so <laughs> um, I'm excited. Um, but yeah, the mentorship's been great, uh, getting to talk to, especially talking to other women who use drugs and are like badass activists and um, you know, meeting so many awesome community members that are doing awesome work around the world. Um, it's just been an unparalleled opportunity. Um, yeah, just so grateful to have met so many of you. Um, a lot of really cool Australians, New Zealanders, people from the UK, South Africans, people from all over the world. It's been amazing. Um, and one of the things that I'm hoping to do with some of the award money is because I'm in Phoenix, we're right kind of on the US-Mexico border. Um, and some of you may have attended the Trank Dope, Fre What Fresh Hells This, you know, session in here the other day. Um, you know, we get a lot of novel designer drugs, a lot of fentanyl. Um, we don't have much insight. We're deliberately, it's a classics felony uh, to even try to test our drugs where I live. 
Um, so we're deliberately prevented from having knowledge about the drugs we take and then blamed for when we encounter harm from those drugs. So I'm hoping to uh, be able to implement some drug user facing drug testing uh, so that we can actually get some transparency into the local drug supply and understand more about the drugs that we're using. Um, I know that we especially see a lot of wounds where I live. It's all black tar heroin, so a lot of particulate matter. Um, and really, like, we don't, like, we just don't really know why. Um, I mean, a lot of it's probably, like, lack of resources. Um, but, yeah, so having drug testing will at least help us have some measure of safety and security um, that we do not have. So that's one thing I'm looking to do with uh, the award money as well as the mentorship. Um, and, yeah, it looks like I've almost used up all my time. But um, again, I'm just really humbled and grateful for this opportunity. And as I've traveled after receiving the award, so many people have, uh, you know, come up to me and told, shared stories about the new Jude and the impact that she had on so many people all over the world. It's like amazing to hear. And um, yeah, so it's just very humbling to be uh, part of the first inaugural year award. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. sure you, you'll all agree that was uh, hugely inspiring. We're, we're now going to move on to uh, our keynote speakers this morning, followed by uh, questions. And our first speaker is Professor uh, Magdalena Harris, who's from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, over to you, Magdalena. Oh, thank you, thank you, and I'm um, wonderful to be on after the June, Jude Byrne uh, Award. You know, Jude was a good friend of mine, and uh, it feels particularly special to be talking uh, after, these, after seeing this wonderful young woman. All right, so um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about community-led models for improving the health of people who use drugs, successes, challenges, and next steps, and these are my disclosures, and I'd really like to thank the the community activists and allies that I've talked to in thinking about this quite complicated presentation, really. It's a lot to talk about in 20 minutes. Okay, so if we think about community-led activism, what comes to my mind first is the pivotal role of civil disobedience in foregrounding and informing public health emergency responses. And we can think about this in relation to two critical moments uh, from the 1980s HIV epidemic through to the current and ongoing drug poisoning crisis and drug overdose crisis uh, as currently experienced, particularly in North America, but also here in Glasgow. And we can see that people who use drugs have created Created strategic alliances, including with researchers, to save lives, to innovate, and to form harm reduction policy. And this crucial role of community is recognised and enshrined in UN commitments. For example, the 2016 UN Political Declaration on HIV and AIDS ensures that at least 30% of all service delivery is community-led by 2030. And more recently, we have a commitment that by 2025, 30% of HIV testing and treatment will be community-led, 80% of prevention services for high-risk populations will be community-led, and 60% of programs to achieve societally enabling environments to be community-led. Now, why is this important? This is important because it's a, a important strategic leverage that community organisations to use to acquire funding and to hold their governments to account. And I think the UK government in particular is uh, agrariously lacking on this front. Also, that people who use drugs are identified as a key population in this response. Um, so what do we mean by community-led? And I'm going to go on and talk about this throughout this presentation, but I'm going to draw here on the community experts definition that was brought together during the UNAIDS consultation, where they say community-led responses are actions and strategies that seek to improve the health and human rights of their constituencies that are specifically informed and implemented by and for communities. And what is interesting, and after all of these definitions, and there are quite a few in this consultation, that there is a caveat along these lines. 
not all responses that take place in communities are community-led. And I, want to, I will touch upon that in relation to the difference that I'm going to demarcate between community-led responses under a human rights remit and more peer involvement, service-led responses that are often more in relation to a public health orientation. And why also are these commitments important? Because we, here we see an explicit human rights commitment, which can be really drawn on and leveraged, and as I'm going to talk about throughout this time, I think is fundamental. And that we can see that social enablers here are defined as including advocacy, community and political mobilisation, as well as human rights programmes such as law and policy reform and stigma and discrimination reduction. So, this is important because um, from a human rights perspective where I place and where I see community-led activism and mobilisation operating, the determinants of health are much bigger than things like access to testing and treatment, and, uh, and that they'll be acting on you know, macro-environmental issues such as structural discrimination against people who use drugs, criminalisation of drug use. Whereas if we're thinking about peer involvement, which comes within a more public health orientated remit, this is often much more orientated to acting on some of these more individual level or uh, micro-environmental responses, such as uh, education, awareness, helping people access testing and treatment. And while these are all important, I think that they obscure the broader uh, human rights issues that we really need to take into account to act upon the health of people who use drugs. And David Sablani from the White Noise Movement, Georgia, says it here well. The biggest enemy to us is not any infection or any substance. It is the policy that is creating all the risk. So there's a lot to cover in this presentation and not much time. I'm going to whip through some case examples looking at civil disobedience, capacity building and research. So in relation to civil disobedience, I'm sure you would all know and hope that you do um, the amazing work that early community organisations such as Janky Bond in Rotterdam, the National AIDS Brigade and others in New York and America did in implementing needle exchange at a time when it was against the law and people were risking their lives and liberty in doing so. But people were doing so to, to save lives in their community. You know, and uh, Sam Friedman provides a great um, history of these and other organisations at the time. And he points out, you know, when HIV visibly entered the Rotterdam IDU community, neither authorities nor drug treatment institutions responded quickly. Junkie Bond quickly extended its controversial needle exchange program through distributing syringes in the street. They pressured authorities to change their policy approach. The public health response in Rotterdam re rapidly changed. And we can see this in other places as well. You know, that it was through community mobilisation, it was through acts of civil disobedience that policy was, there was policy was able to be changed. And we have this as well in relation to safe consumption sites. You know, it's been a huge honour to meet and hear Anne Livingston speak um, at this conference. You know, she, she is a great inspiration, for, I hope, for all of us. And that she opened one of uh, the first injecting, uh, un unsanctioned injecting sites in North America in 1995. And uh, with Bud Osborne founded Vandu in 1998. In Glasgow, we have uh, Peter Crikant, who's done amazing work in highlighting the real issue of uh, rising drug-related deaths in Scotland and doing something importantly to try and sort it out. Um, in New York City, more recently, we have uh, the first sanctioned overdose prevention centre pilots opening. And again, this life-saving one comes after years of hard support advocacy led by the Drug Policy Alliance and our allies. Um, it's been great. I'm really pleased at this conference to have heard presentations on safe supply. So I'm not going to talk about this too much, but just to acknowledge the important work of the Drug User Liberation Front in collaboration with Vandu in helping to save lives in the face of a toxic drug supply crisis. 
If we turn now to capacity building, how have drug user organisations worked within the law to create opportunities for advocacy, to organise and to resource? And here I'd like to provide an example of the Bridge Hope Health Organisation, founded in 2015 by Rahim and provided with technical support from community-led organisations such as COACT, led by Matt Southwell, also with um, Buff, and you can see He's here uh, giving support, advocacy support to local users in Afghanistan. And uh, Rahim talks about, you know, he says, because I'm a drug user, I know what is wrong for drug users. They are always insulted and humiliated. If they come to collect by force the drug user, they beat him. Criminalisation does not allow us to help our community. So while this organisation is acting within a public health remit, they're providing needle and syringe, they're providing wound care, they're providing referrals to testing and treatment, they are orientating themselves within a much broader public a human rights orientation and that the biggest problem here is criminalisation, is the hostile environment which makes their work so hard but also makes it so important and so courageous. We can see here in the Tanzania network of people who use drugs. Uh, Happy Hassan talks about the real importance of uh, firstly medicine demand and, and helping to initiate methadone in their country, which then helped drug users to, 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 to organise and to mobilise so that more people could access methadone and other important harm reduction interventions. And you know, poignantly she says, we belong to the streets, the ghettos, the camps, but then then now we belong on the tables. They have been brought in, they're a part of important policy decisions helping to change the law. And in relation to research, I would encourage all researchers uh, in the audience uh, and to tell your research of friends that aren't here to please go and look at uh, you know, the community-led principles for engaging with research for people who use drugs. And, uh, and here we have an example from Vandu, and I'd just like to highlight you know, one of their principles for researchers. Your researchers should leave the organisations of oppressed people that they work with stronger than when they come at, came in. If they don't, they are part of the problem and not part of the solution. And it is a real pleasure to see more publications, more awareness of this uh, by community-led organisations such as this publication here by the North Carolina Survivors Union. And to highlight also the important work of the Urban Survivors Union in highlighting the real need to capacitate and support community-led research and the huge problems that they have had in engaging with academic researchers to do so. And they highlight the important issue of uh, lack of takeaway methadone during COVID and the risk that they were placed under by, by services that were meant to be providing a harm reduction response. But in order to try and carry out this research and to, uh, and to instigate change, they faced a myriad of hurdles by their academic partners. And so uh, I really encourage people to look at this very powerful article, which really talks about, um, about these problems and provides also uh, a response, a solution. So I've been asked, also <laughs> within 20 minutes to talk about successes and challenges. I'm not going to talk about successes, they speak for themselves. You know, we know of the successes of this work, but there are many challenges and I'm gonna to touch upon a few. Some of these challenges are in relation to tokenis, tokenism, to lack of funding, to poor payment or no payment, and to gatekeeping. I heard uh, Sean Shelley in a wonderful presentation yesterday talking about the irony in the UK of organisations only being able to hire peers if they are in fact not peers i.e. that they need to be in recovery. And we write about this in, uh, in this article here from 2017 of the real issues of, um, of people acting as peers who are no longer using drugs and how difficult it is for them to actually effectively uh, you know, reach and connect with people who are actively using. And, you know, this is not okay. This is not what community-led looks like. 
Um, also from Canada, we have a drug user activist saying, what we mean by peer or community-led has been taken up to create a classist distinction in our work and workplaces, with lower wages and roles that are seen as unskilled for highly skilled jobs. These are highly skilled jobs. People with lived experience are bringing their expertise and need to be fairly recompensed for it. And, and you know, lastly, I am absolutely sick to death of fighting my institutional ethics board who are coming back to me, and again yesterday, are coming back to me and saying I should not be paying people for their time because if I'm giving cash to people who use drugs, God forbid they might go and buy drugs with it. You know, it drives me absolutely up the wall. And, you know, yet again I have to fight this fight. And I shouldn't have to do it. It is not ethical to be getting these responses from ethical boards. Another challenge is the need to constantly pro prove legitimacy within a hostile policy environment. And people, community organisations are having to do this by aligning themselves with a public health remit. And here I'd like to give the case of New Zealand where I worked as a peer in a needle exchange and, and I wrote about the history with others of this needle exchange. And as with other community groups, you know, this work was the result of activism and civil disobedience by the affected community and health professional allies. And it was a very difficult time in New Zealand as well as elsewhere. You have these horrendous uh, transcripts from parliamentary debates at the time. An excerpt is, I do not think it is possible to have the perfect solution to the problem when the position is one of a balance of awfulness. Nobody recovers from AIDS, one can be cured of drug abuse. That is therefore the factor that determines one's attitude to the matter. So in order to get funding, in order to get policy change, drug user organisations have to align themselves with this balance of awfulness and talk about that they are going to help eradicate HIV and then hepatitis C, that they are going to help protect the broader community from themselves as vectors of transmission. It is not okay. But this, this is the, you know, the situation in which we were in and often the situation in which we still remain. And you can see this in the, um, uh, Mike Lee talking about opening up DIVA, the, the needle exchange in Dunedin. He said, we had some opposition, but I was articulate with them, went on TV, etc. We were quite professional. It was a drug user organisation, but that was kept under wraps. We were there to stop the virus. We didn't want to get this closed down. There was a lot of fear. So, you know, really telling. This was a drug user organisation, but that was kept under wraps. You know, and you can see here in the early DIVA sign that there's no mention of drug use. There's no mention of a drug user organisation. It's HIV and AIDS prevention. Now, the problem with this is that it leads to appropriation by medicalisation. And, um, you know, Costello here in a filter article talks about visiting uh, safe consumption sites in Europe and she says, every program I visited was clean and medical, government funded and seamlessly integrated into public health policy. But to my surprise, I saw little evidence of drug user led activism. The edgy scrappy side of drug reduction, that agitation for change so visible in the United States seemed absent. And Neve Eastwood from Release, who, who's wonderful to have heard open this, uh, this wonderful conference, you know, said harm reduction has become more contained within the medical model at the expense of funding for grassroots activism. And here you can see the impact of this here. Uh, another, you know, a drug user activist I talked to uh, and thinking about this presentation talks about we fought for overdose prevention sites. We made one, but when the community health service took over, they changed it, they co-opted it. It was no longer what we had envisaged. So, you know, why is a human rights orientation important? It's important because that community organisations seeking legitimacy within a public health remit risk biomedical appropriation. It's important because public health funding orientated to disease prevention obscures broader community needs and is potentially precarious. And this, this 
rather agrarious example from Robert Heimer uh, et al. He talks about finding that actually there isn't as much evidence to suggest hepatitis C transmission through injecting equipment alone. And so the conclusion they draw is that programs may want to reconsider expanding scarce resources to provide supplies that will do little or nothing to present hepatitis C transmission. Spending money on objects that can have little impact on disease transmission should become to be viewed as prefigurate. But, you know, what about the dignity? What about, you know, uh, the, he's talking about clean water, he's talking about filters, he's talking about cookers. We shouldn't fund them, let alone their impact on other issues such as skin and soft tissue infections. They provide dignity to the injecting experience, and people should be able to have access to them, regardless of, of disease transmission. Um, it's really important that we take a human rights orientation because a public health orientation can reinforce perceptions of people who use drugs as diseased and as in need of treatment. You know, and this is crucial when we think about safe supply. Is this treatment? You know, if we had methadone and we have safe supply, how many people would still want methadone? Is safe supply a treatment against the disease of addiction or is it treatment against the disease of prohibition? You know, and we really need to, to think about this. And, and there's a wonderful quote from Dr. Andrea Serrera, you know, saying, instead of doctors being required to generate evidence to do this in a medicalised context and become gatekeepers now to cocaine as well, the government should just step up and have the moral authority to legalise and regulate it. Also, importantly, health is too narrowly conceived. It obscures important community needs. And this is a really poignant example from the, the drug reporter uh, documentary on Afghanistan, where a community member talks to Rahim and said, we addicts don't have graves and our dead bodies are left here for weeks. We don't only need a solution for dead bodies. Although we are addicts, and apologies for that, that word, <laughs> but uh, it's used by the community member, we are also Muslims and our families are coming and there are no graves in which they could pray for us. This is not a public health issue, this is a human rights and dignity issue and it's absolutely vital for, you know, to improve the health of these people. So, you know, if we look from these two sort of pivotal points from the 1980s through to today, we have seen the crucial role of community-led organisations breaking the law to save lives. You know, and I really would like to honour and thank all the community members in this, in this audience uh, today. You know, and I wear lots of hats and, you know, I also want to say I'm also a community member, but I think there are other people that are probably better placed to do this presentation than me. But, um, yeah, so, I, and, I, to, to, and just to say, there's this quote here at the bottom around uh, New Zealand, and I, I include this because I want to stress the importance of allies, of a professional allies, of people stepping up to support and fund community organisations. So in New Zealand, this included a small number of pharmacists who supplied syringes to people who use drugs illegally in defiance of their professional body. So to also acknowledge the important role of friendly allied professionals in this fight. So, you know, where next, what is needed? I say, you know, we need an unashamedly human rights orientation to improving the health of people who use drugs. We obviously need drug policy reform. We need decriminalisation or legalisation beyond medicalisation. We need to reignite urgency. We need to recalibrate research ethics so we don't stymie important community-led research. We need strong allies. We need collaboration, not co-option. We need to facilitate and fund and honour community-generated evidence. And we need to hold our governments and our local communities to account to achieve 30, 80, 60 by 2025. Thank you. so much, that's fantastic. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce Professor Dame Carol Black. Um, 
Professor Dame Carol Black is the chair of the British Library, the Centre for Ageing Better, and Think Ahead, amongst many other roles. But from our point of view, she's probably best known as the independent advisor to the UK government on combating misuse of drugs. She produced a major two-part report that contained 32 recommendations for change and a way forward for the UK. It's wonderful to have you here. Please make her feel welcome. <coughs> Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sure you will realise that I'm not the expert that you are. Um, I'm simply the person that the Westminster government asked in 2019 to do an independent review on drugs. And uh, that's what I tried to do. I tried to do it as honestly as I could. I absolutely sought evidence because I thought if I gave them evidence, I might have a chance of persuading them uh, to think differently. But I do want to stress I am in no way an expert um, in this field. Um, in my terms of reference for my review, there were two exclusions. You should be aware of those. One, I couldn't consider anything that needed a change in the law. So anything I did had to be able to be within the law of the land. And secondly, um, and very sadly, I wasn't allowed to look at uh, care of drug dependent people in prison. And afterwards I realized that would have been something I could have made a contribution to. Now you gave me an exam question. Um, <clears throat> how should we address the broader social and health issues among people who inject drugs? Well, I hope that what I tried to do in my report is one answer to that. Because really, <clears throat> what I've tried to do is say that by treating drug addiction as a complex chronic health condition, and that's a message I tried to give to the government, and it required a multifaceted, coordinated, whole system approach at both central and local level. Excuse me. Um, what I found and what really disturbed me was that it was piecemeal, that it was divided, that it was uncooperative, and it was very poorly funded. And Although what I'm presenting to you today is in some way a systems reform, it's very much based on putting the person at the center. So the report, um, and there may be some of you who are not aware of that report, based on two parts. Part one, I was asked to look at supply and demand, um, published in February 2020, just before um, the pandemic struck, I took a market review. I looked at where any drugs were coming from, um, how did they come into the country, what were they worth, how did they get to the user, um, the scale of increasing harm that was evident, the quality and capacity of drug treatment, which had reduced over about 10 years of austerity, and the premature deaths. And all of you will be aware that they occurred disproportionately in deprived areas, and particularly as far as we were concerned. And my report, by the way, had to concentrate mainly on England health as a devolved um, area for uh, Scotland and Wales. So there were limitations um, in what I could do. But wherever you look in the United Kingdom, the problem is much worse in deprived areas, particularly um, in our case in England, in the north of the country. Um, so that part didn't have um, any recommendations. It was laying the problem bare, and the problem was pretty awful wherever I looked. I never thought they'd let me do part two, because I thought I would have annoyed them so much that simply I would have been sent away and told that I couldn't do part two. But they did let me do part two. And that was about treatment and recovery, which I examined in detail. 
and I found the system broken and wanting. I found very little that was good about it. And I said very simply and clearly, government must either invest in tackling the problem or keep paying the consequences. The annual cost in 2019 to the UK government was 19.2 billion as for the problem as a whole. The pandemic, of course, has widened inequalities and therefore, are with the present current economic situation, likely to make things worse. You will know these figures better than I, um, but I just list them there. I'm certainly um, not going to read through them. But everywhere I looked, the capacity and quality of treatment had absolutely declined, where at the same time, um, the prevalence of use and harm had increased, um, particularly among school-aged children, young people. Number of people going into treatment was falling. Treatment really had become, in some places, very poor, um, very poorly funded. Um, and I'm sure you were all aware that a third of prison places in this country um, are, are filled by people who have a drug dependency problem, and that absolutely needs addressing. So what I did was really quite simple. Um, I put the individual at the center and said, what did I think, and from the research I was doing, what does someone who is drug dependent in the context of treatment and recovery need? What needs to be wrapped around them? And you can see the things I put there. You might want to add to that. But what I actually found that was in most places, really, it was not much more than really a methadone service. And therefore, anything to do with mental health and trauma support, family support, education, housing, um, citizens' advice, benefits, employment, I couldn't find it in most places. And if you approach, I think, someone who wishes to be in the treatment and recovery system and you only offer that, then you will fail. And everything was divided up, uh, fragmented. And one of the first things I said to government was that if you wish to change this, then you need at least six government departments properly working together, and you can see them listed there. You might want to add to that list. These are the essential ones. And I said you need a central unit that brings those departments together, and we need a minister, a minister who's going to support us, who's going to keep these departments with their feet to the fire, and will report annually to Parliament. So it was really a case of just asking myself what did the, what did the individual person need. Um, I found little respect or dignity um, in any form of treatment that I could see for most people who had a drug dependency problem. So this slide really, I've just tried to put the reviews, recommendations into little boxes, the areas I looked at, the areas I wrote about, um, and I, I wanted the whole thing to be a systems review, a systems reform, and it was obvious we couldn't do any of this without additional investment. Getting money out of the Treasury um, is difficult. I couldn't find who was responsible locally. I would go around different parts of the UK and say, well, who do I talk to to tell me what's really going on in this area? Always very difficult to do. I got knocked from pillar to post. Um, one part of the system always sent me to the next part because nobody really was taking responsibility. Little partnership working. And the workforce had diminished considerably and the workforce in recovery was, as been mentioned by a previous speaker, often not paid in an appropriate way. I found it very distasteful 
and unacceptable that people who were working in recovery were often just treated as volunteers. I didn't think that to be right. So one thing I'll perhaps bring out there that really worried me, um, not a very practical factor, but I couldn't find support or enough support for research and science. And that was also something that I very much tried um, to change. Now, in doing this review, and I can't talk about all of these, these are some of the things that troubled me. Drug dependency is simply not on an equal footing with any other chronic remitting condition. I'm a hospital doctor at my heart. I looked after people with chronic conditions for many years, and I certainly didn't sign them off. If they had a chronic condition, they stayed on my books. I knew they might relapse. I knew my job was to help them as soon as possible. I found lacking patient advocacy. When I looked to things like uh, mental health or heart disease, there are people who advocate for those patients, or if you wish to call people clients, but who, however you describe the group that I was trying to help, I couldn't see where patient advocacy was coming from. That worried me. Mental health and trauma services were really almost non-existent. And I won't read out all the others, but all of those are broad health and social issues that I was seeking um, to change and bring to the government's attention. I'll just mention one or two of them. I really never want to hear the word dual diagnosis again. Um, I, I mean, the idea that, that mental health isn't an integral part of drug dependency is just ridiculous. Now, if you had, if I had breast cancer and rheumatoid arthritis, no doctor would dare say to me, I'll deal with your breast cancer when you have been and got your rheumatoid under control. I would be in front of the GMC. So why and where have we managed to get into this stage for drug dependent care? If there's one thing that could stop what I've written ever coming into good fruition, it will be if we cannot solve the mental health and trauma support. I'm very, very aware that without that, I don't think anything I've written or tried to do can actually um, go to fruition. So I'm putting a lot of effort into this particular problem. As I think those of you from the UK will understand getting the Department of Health and NHS England to work together to understand and do something about this uh, is requiring a lot of patience and work and persuading Health Education England to really develop competency and training for all staff working people with coexisting mental health and drug dependency problems. Again, is something we're trying to do with the new strategy. I, I don't need to tell you this audience about comorbidities. I won't delay on this slide, but as you can imagine, I find it to be really in no way adequate. Housing, I, I really wanted in the review to try and get from government some financial support um, towards better housing. We've got some, we haven't got enough, but again, it, it is so obvious that we need to try and make sure that the housing that is offered is appropriate. It's not okay just to be able to offer a place to live. And I found there'd be very little thought in DULUC, the uh, housing department, to think about what is appropriate. So it's not just can we find a home, can we find somewhere for someone to live, it's is that, is that place appropriate to their needs. And we have a long, long way to go on this. So I do try to meet regularly with the ministers uh, in the department of leveling up uh, to try and move this forward. And then I've always been a passionate 
supporter of enabling people with drug dependency if they want to, to be able to work. And that is truly difficult. Um, in 2016, I'd recommended to the Department of Work and Pensions a trial using individual placement support, which as you know is an intensive employment support intervention, um, to enable, it was first trialed um, for people with uh, enduring mental health issues to help them move towards the world of work and give support while they were in work at the beginning of that transition. Um, we have managed to get support uh, for IPS for every part of England as we move forward rolling out my review. But giving that opportunity and making it a reality, um, I believe to be really important and that's what people who are drug dependent told me. It made a huge difference to have the potential to be in work. Um, Workforce, <laughs> I've just put here one or two facts I found when I was doing the review. It didn't matter where I looked. Uh, again, we didn't have enough of any kind of worker and the average caseload for drug and alcohol worker in the survey I did was 50 and some people were looking after 80. You can't do a good job if you're looking after that number of people. It's, it's really quite impossible. And we're really in the foothills. We are writing, or Health Education England is writing a new strategy. We're trying very hard to be innovative and think how do we, how do we ever get people back into this uh, particular um, work. Um, I think a few people are coming back, but I do think we need to innovate. I'll just give you this example. I'm not saying this is what we should do, but I think we've got to think, are there any training programs already around that we've got that could help us and that with a bit of innovation um, might be useful to the treatment and recovery program for drug dependency. So I'll give you the example of Think Ahead. It's a program funded by the Department of Health. Um, it provides a very fast stream training program for mental health social workers. I would quite like to see that expanded um, to perhaps make an additional addiction mental health social worker because it would seem to me we don't need necessarily just to have a lot more medics, but we do need to have more people with the right skills um, in, in, this, uh, in this sector. So that's just one example. And this was another of my recommendations, which I hope um, we're going to be able to take forward. Could we have an organization um, that would bring together a body, a, a centre for addiction, where anybody working in substance misuse could feel they had a place. I would hate it to be a medical health professional centre, but I think that would be helpful if we could give um, some support and, and enable people who were working in substance misuse the feeling that they had a body that was there for them, so I'm hoping that that will happen. As some of you in the audience will know, the government did accept my review and on December the 6th of 2021 published their new 10-year drug strategy um, and with it um, to uh, uh, specifically new money for drugs uh, for treatment and recovery was about 800 million, but in total, the spend was much more, and that was new money, and we're now trying to use that as well as we can. So we've got a new 10-year drug strategy, we have some financial resource, and really the ambition is to create a system where no one falls through the gaps, where there's no stigma attached to addiction, and where, from my point of view, it's treated as a chronic health condition 
complex, which requires a lot of other things to enable people to make a good response, and where people are provided with long-term support. I don't want people just signed off. So what are we trying to do? It's a huge journey. We're trying to rebuild local authority commissioned services. We're trying to improve quality, capacity, and outcomes. We're trying to rebuild the workforce. We're trying to ensure a better integration of services so that the physical and mental and social needs are addressed. We're trying to reduce harm and support recovery. I should just say to you, I think we're in the foothills. I think there's a long way for us to go. Um, much is happening. We've started. Um, we have now got a central unit. We've got local drug um, partnership boards. We've got a senior responsible officer who will have to answer the question of where have we got to. So I hope we're repairing and rebuilding. But I don't think this is a one-year, two-year, three-year job. I think this is a, um, at least probably a six to seven-year job and probably 10. So in the forward to my review, the part two of it, where my recommendations were, I said that my hope was to really bring change to those individuals and families and communities whose lives are blighted by drug addiction and by the criminals who exploit it. I do have a role as long as uh, we have the present government. Um, I don't know what a change of government would do, but I do have a role as an independent advisor. And while I'm doing that, I will do all I can to try and make this a much better place. Professor Sir John Strang, who uh, in this country would be considered one of the great experts on drug dependency, said to me um, that he met her mother Teresa towards the end of her life. And she said to him that she thought in this century, the century we live in, that we would still find that drug-dependent people are treated like lepers. I have to say to you that when I was doing my review, I considered that the way we treat people who are dependent on drugs to be totally unacceptable. So thank you. Thanks so much for, for that uh, presentation and uh, I think we'd all agree we'd hope that the UK government uh, would continue to listen to Dame Carroll. We now um, can open it out for, for questions. We've got uh, about 13 minutes for questions so um, if anyone wants to ask that I'll maybe kick off just to pick up the point around uh, government departments and government de departments um, actually talking to each other. Um, I've spent most of my career trying to, to do that and I just it was I suppose a question around how can we actually do that because often what you see is that one government department policy actually works against another and actually to, to the detriment of what we're trying to do. Do you want to? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think you're absolutely right but you know that they don't actually talk to each other and I think the first thing I did was make them all sit in the same room and we met very regularly and I would find that there would initially perhaps be excuses why a certain department couldn't come. And I found one of the best ways that we really got it to work, um, your new perm sec in Scotland, JP Marks, was at DWP at the time and JP became my champion in the civil service and he got them all round the table. And it was interesting over about a year to see the change in willingness and enthusiasm once they saw this was a complex problem and they all had to own a bit of it. Um, and every time they took their toys out of the pram, you, your chances of enabling somebody 
to work, walk along the route to recovery, if they couldn't get housing, if they couldn't get support to work, you know, DWP might say, well, this is such a small thing, um, you know, in our total responsibility with me saying, but if you're not there, you diminish what we can do. But I think really it was having JP as, as a seen he was the director general then. So it, it required somebody from inside to help me do it. I didn't do it alone. Thank you. Mike, Mike Delaney, do you want to comment uh, on that? No. Um, we've got a question over, over on the, that side. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. What a fantastic session. Um, question for Dame Carroll. Um, it would appear that your brief had, uh, had a, a, a significant dental extraction before you, uh, before you received it and you were unable to look at uh, anything that was outside, as you said, the current law. Um, if you'd have been able to operate without that constraint, and look at the international response, um, including law. What area do you think you, you could have made most impact on? Oh, snap, I had exactly the same question for you. The question is, if you were allowed to include legal change, legal reform, what would it be? I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, for the main reason um, that I haven't really ever studied it. Right. And, and I do think before you get to a sort of considered view, you really have to be able to have the opportunity to look at the evidence. Sure. And although I do get um, some evidence, of course, I don't know the literature, I'll be quite frank. I don't know, I haven't been able to say, I'd love to have the opportunity to talk to the Canadian government and say, really, what is it really like? Mm -hmm. um, I would just put to you that worries me in this country that the regulation of alcohol by our government has been so uh, unable to control the problems mm -hmm. that we've got and we have an increasing health issue with people really suffering from the effects of alcohol and they haven't done that very well. Mm. Okay, thank you. I think we've got uh, a, another question. Mm. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you both for really amazing speeches. They were a uh, very uh, powerful uh, conclusion to this conference. So um, I wanted to, I was involved in, uh, from t uh, 1999 to 2004 in uh, setting up a, a UK drug user network where we brought all types of drug users together. We were invited by the deputy drug czar to engage in a dialogue with government. And then we experienced our network being systematically destroyed by infighting between different government departments and then systematically going out to our donors to stop them funding us. And largely that was because as drug users, we came out of the HIV epidemic with a human rights analysis. We understood that what was happening to us wasn't just about public health, it was also about the law, it was also about human rights. Because we came with that analysis, we were seen as a threat and I think in many ways what's happened in the UK since that time is the absence of an advocacy voice for people who use drugs has allowed this devastation of our drug treatment system in the last 10 to 15 years. And Dame Carroll, I wanted to say that initially I was very, very concerned about your review, the absence of being able to look at policy I thought was a real oversight and limitation on your work. But I really want to thank you because I was wrong that you've actually managed to use your more contained focus to make really, really important commentaries on the destruction of our drug treatment system. And on behalf of people who use drugs, I would like to thank you for that analysis that has allowed things that we've been saying for decades to finally be heard by government. So I just wanted you to, uh, if both of you could comment on the implications of not having strong advocacy for people who use drugs within a system and what the implications of that are for policy. Um. Yeah, Magdalena might want to go first. Yeah. Um, all right. Yeah, I think, thank you, Matt. Um, I think this is primarily for Dame, Dame Carol, but I mean, I, I just couldn't agree more. And I think it's really, it's, it, it's very sad that there's a, a lack of strong government supported and funded drug user activism in the UK. And that, um, you know, really that this needs to include people who are currently using drugs as well as people who may no, no longer be using drugs. You know, the response needs to be coming from people who are using drugs to help uh, inform 
you know, better treatment systems where treatment is needed, but also in relation to, to broader um, supports, including for uh, law reform. Um, but, you know, I'm, you're talking to the converted, I agree. So I'm going to pass it over to, to Dame Carroll. Yeah, the, the question was just about the role of advocacy. You, you, you mentioned that in your yeah. own presentation yeah. well, as well and the yeah. lack of that. I, well, I, I would love to see uh, um, more advocacy. I mean, in most conditions, you do have, if I can may use the word patient, you do have a strong patient voice. And then you will have often a healthcare charity or, dare I say, a royal college that is behind that. Do you know, so you, you have the patient, you have the families, and then if you're lucky, you can also get some heave from, um, from the professional bodies, whether it be, you know, the, the, a royal college or, or the um, Society of Psychologists, I've probably got their name wrong, but I didn't see any of that. It's almost as if they were, the professional bodies just didn't see it as their job and they were almost ashamed. And I have had a fairly direct conversation with my own profession about this because we could do so much more. We could be very much better advocates. Um, sure. And I think it's a great lack and I don't know why we've got into this situation because if I think of almost every other condition, we have got that advocacy. Um, and for so many people who are drug dependent, as far as I can see, they don't have a voice. Yes, I think, thank you very much. I think what's really interesting, and we, we probably need to wrap it up in a minute or two, I think what's really interesting is the two contrasting positions we've seen here. I think Matt's acknowledging the really deep dive into treatment and recovery. <laughs> And I think what Magdalena's talking about is not about treatment and no, recovery, she, no. but about activism and drug user rights. Mm. And maybe the challenge is how do we bring these two quite contrasting positions to either work alongside each other, learn from each other, maybe coexist in some kind of way. I'm not sure whether either of you would like to comment on that in closing. Um, yeah, I'd just like to pick up on what Matt said actually and that he talked about there being a strong drug user organising movement in the UK early on coming out of HIV activism with a very much you know, human rights, strength based approach and I, I'm just concerned about this talk about patient organisations and health, you know, that this is uh, disempowering in a way and it is again looking at um, drug use as, as a disease, as an illness, as something to be cured, whereas what Matt is talking about is, you know, organisations of people who choose to use drugs or choose to whatever, like many of you in the audience may choose to use alcohol or coffee or sugar or whatever it is that you use, and being able to, to mobilise, to look after your own health, whatever that may involve, that this is not just about uh, people wanting to cease using drugs, uh, but they may have other health issues and other health concerns, but primarily also to acting upon the structures which create hostile environments which make it difficult for them to look after their health, which is around law reform, you know, and I really, I, I, I think that this is what we need to address and that we need to empower drug user organisations not within a health or a patient remit, you know, that there is nothing wrong with us, you know. Um, thank, thank you, Magdalena. That's, um, that, that's a really excellent, I think, example of the, of the position um, that you've um, been presenting today. Dame Carol? But I don't think there should be um, a barrier to what Magdalene has said or what I've said because in a way what I'd be trying to say is how important it is to ensure the health and well-being of people who are indeed, and you're rightly saying, I'm putting it in the sense of the treatment and recovery system. Mm. I see it as a journey. If 
I looked after people uh, with chronic conditions who were never, ever going to, if you like, really, in my terms, be able to um, get their disease under control. This is in a very medical sense. Mm. But I wanted to support them to live the best lives mm. they could. Mm. So for me, at least the first step um, in what I was trying to do in the report was to really ensure that people who were drug dependent got the best possible sure. support in a complex way, whether that be housing, whether that be drugs. I never, during that report, I think and I hope, ever made any, I mean, I was trying to be helpful rather than say, this is a terrible thing to be doing. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you both. I think what we're hearing is a real diversity of perspectives and experiences from two people who are incredibly um, expert in what they're talking about. Please join with me in thanking both Magdalena Harris, Carol Dan. Thank you very much. We're now moving to two um, abstract-driven sessions. Um, I'm delighted to be welcoming um, Marie Joffret Roussade. No, my French is terrible. Australians can't do accents. I'm terribly sorry. Marie is a sociologist in France. She's been studying harm reduction and drug-using risk practices and uh, we're delighted that she's presenting here today. Please make Marie feel welcome. So thank you, Alison. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers to give me the opportunity uh, to present the French experience on a drug consumption room evaluation. So my name is Marie Geoffrey Roustide, and uh, I am um, a French researcher. Uh, um, I'm based in Paris, and I'm working at the National Institute of Health and Medical Research. So I would like to thank the co my co-authors who co-lead with me um, this evaluation. Uh, my talk today is entitled Health Benefits and Public Order Improvements after the implementation of two drug consumption rooms in France, results from the COSINUT cohort survey. So to begin, I have no conflict of interest to declare, and I would like to thank all the people who inject drugs who participate in the study, and I also would like to thank all the harm reduction providers who welcomed our research team in their facilities. Um, I will also begin with some elements about the French context. So in 2016, in France, two drug consumption rooms were implemented, one in Paris and another in Strasbourg. And we were very late in France because we opened these two rooms 30 years after Switzerland and other uh, European um, countries. So these two drug consumption rooms were implemented in France only for an experiment period of six years, and they were opened in the context of a very intense political controversy. The experiment was also conditioned to an evaluation that has been conducted by INSERM, and the evaluation was focused on the effectiveness of drug consumption room, and it included a sociological survey on public safety and social acceptance, and also a cohort survey called COSINUS that was more mainly focused on health outcomes. Today, I will only uh, present the COSINUS cohort survey. So the main question of our cohort survey was to evaluate the drug consumption room's impact on, main, on different main outcomes. So drug consumption rooms are dedicated and secure places where people can inject safely. 
And in these rooms, uh, they can have access to sterile equipment and also other harm reduction services. In the qualitative part of our work, people with lived experience described drug consumption rooms as protective refuge where people felt being considered as citizens. I will mainly speak about public health today, but I think that the stigma thing is something very important to underline in our discourse. So, in our cohort survey, we evaluate the impact of drug consumption rooms on several main outcomes, overdose, HIV and HCV at risk practices, injection in public space, abscesses, emergency room visits, and criminal activity. So the methodology is a 12 months longitudinal cohort study. We enrolled 664 people who inject drugs in four cities, two cities with the drug consumption rooms, Paris and Strasbourg, and two cities without any drug consumption rooms, Bordeaux and Marseille. We ran face-to-face -face interviews and uh, we collected social behavioral data at enrollment and at three periods of time, three months, six months, and 12 months. We compared two groups, a group of people who were exposed to drug consumption rooms with another group of people who were not exposed to drug consumption rooms, and we considered this second group as a control group. We used the ECMAN method to limit non-randomization bias, and we study uh, the association between drug consumption room exposure and the different outcomes by introducing the IML score into the mixed effects of a probit model. So I will now briefly describe the study population. So we have 664 participants in our cohort. Regarding socio-demographic profiles, we have 20% of women and 80% of men. The median age was uh, 30 years, uh, 38 years, and we have 43% of people who lived in very social precarious condition. That means living in the street or in their car. And we have also only 19% uh, of people who had a paid job. So regarding substances, we have 67% of people who injected substances for months and 10 years. The daily use of substances was as follows. We have 24% of people who used an, on a daily basis unprescribed morphine sulfates, 22% cocaine crack, 11% cocaine, 8% unprescribed buprenorphine, and 3% heroin. So regarding health data, we have 5% of people who declared being HIV positive, 27% of people who declared being HCV positive. 18% of people declared having shared syringe or paraphernalia in the last months, 6% experienced at least one non-fatal overdose um, in the last six months, 38% of people attended an emergency unit in the last six months, and 21% of people experienced at least an abscess in the last six months. Among people who attend DCRs, the uh, satisfaction um, was very high because 95% of people who attend these facilities were sa satisfied by these services. And among people who don't attend um, DCR, there, there were 60% of them who were willing to use this facility. So, we um, have a study population, in our study population, we have people who attend a drug consumption rooms and a group comp comparison of people who didn't attend. So during the whole period of follow-up, we have at least 35% of people who were exposed to drug consumption rooms. And there were differences between uh, the group of people who attend GCRs and the group of people who didn't attend DCR. And these differences uh, were also linked to city-specific differences. 
So in the group uh, who attend um, drug consumption rooms, so this group had a, a higher education level. They were more often born outside uh, of France, and they lived in uh, more precarious social conditions. They used more uh, on a daily basis uh, crack, cocaine crack, and also more unprescribed morphine use and they declared more often being a HCV uh, positive. I will now focus on the impact uh, of the DCRs on the main outcomes that we studied in our court. So regarding HIV and HCV at risk practices, we showed a decrease of uh, 10 points of percentage for people who attend DCRs. For abscesses in the last six months, a decrease of 11 points. For non-fatal overdose, a decrease of two points. For emergency room visits, a decrease of 24 points. For criminal activity in the last month, a decrease of 20 po points. And for injection practices in public space, a decrease of 15 points. And we have also three outcomes uh, with either non-significant effect of the dr drug consumption rooms or a negative effect. Um, so these outcomes are being currently on OAT, um, being, uh, having um, access to uh, HCV tested um, in the last six months and um, have access, uh, have, having uh, access to a general practitioner in the last six months. So I will now briefly discuss uh, all these results from the Cosinus cohort survey. So what we can say uh, first is that this year exposure had a real positive effect on public health and public safety, for both for people who inject drugs and also for the neighborhood. So that's the main results of our uh, Cosinus cohort. In terms of access to OAT and HCV testing, our cohort survey showed that there was no significant difference between the two groups. This can be explained by the very high coverage of harm reduction facilities, including access to HCV testing and access to OAT in France that exist beyond DCRs. In France, for example, we have 85% of people who attend harm reduction facilities who are under OAT. It's also very important to note to explain uh, these results that harm reduction in France is public funded and this public funding allow a sustainable access for harm reduction tools such as HCV testing or OAT for people who inject drugs beyond these years. Our survey also showed that people who attend these years have less access to general practitioners compared to the control group. And these results can be explained by structural factors. The first explanation is the difficulties that we have to face in France to recruit medical doctors as well as nurses in these years. The second explanation is the stigma associated to active injecting drug use that makes it more difficult for people who inject drugs to have access to care outside harm reduction services and drug treatment centers. People who inject drugs in France are excluded to care um, in um, the general um, system of care. There are also some limitations that are linked to methodological issues because we have a too short period of follow-up in our COSINUS survey. Our survey was funded by the government for only one year. Another important result that I, was to, I, that I would like to highlight is that beyond characteristics specific to injection practices and settings, the social precariousness underlying all the criteria appears to be a factor of vulnerability as well as cocaine crack use to a lesser extent. And our survey highlights that it is crucial to act on structural vulnerability, including 
in, including changes in social and political determinants of health if we want to improve the efficiency of harm reduction, including the efficiency of drug consumption rooms. And it, to, it is also crucial to act on this structural vulnerability to improve the life of people who inject drugs. To go further, uh, what's next after our COSINUS cohort? So we delivered the results of our global evolu uh, evaluation, including the results of the cohort, the epidemiological part, but also the results of the sociological part in 2021 to the French government. And after these results, so the DCRs were including in public health law in France in 2022. But unfortunately, with um, this um, inclusion, um, is still with the statue of an experiment that will continue. And no new DCR has opened in France since 2016, even if some new projects of DCRs have been announced. Regarding the scientific sphere, we um, will implement a new cohort survey called BIBOP. Uh, this survey will be conducted in three cities, Paris, Strasbourg, and Lyon, and we'll be, we will begin this new cohort in 2023 for a longer period of follow-up and with additional new outcomes, and it will be led by four co-investigators. This new BIOP court will allow us to continue DCR's evaluation in France, but within a multidisciplinary approach that will include public health, social science, and neuroscience. This new court is also embedded in a community-based approach and also includes new topics such as social support, mental health, access to care, quality of life, and stigma. All these topics are also very important for evaluating the effectiveness of drug consumption rooms, and all these topics are also crucial for improving the health and social inclusion of people who inject drugs. If you want to continue the conversation on our evaluation, you can contact me, and I can also refer you to several publications uh, that uh, we did with uh, our team on the social science part and also on the epidemiological part. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Marie, for that update from France on drug consumption rooms. Um, we'll now move um, to our final presentation, which is a, a pre-record from Natasha Martin. Natasha is Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Health in the Department of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego. So hopefully we'll have that just now. Good morning, everybody. I am incredibly sorry that I cannot be there to present in person. Uh, unfortunately, my flight was changed at the last minute, and so I had to leave for the airport. But thank you very much for coming to this presentation and for the opportunity to present our work evaluating the impact and the cost effectiveness of a novel police education program on HIV, hepatitis C, and overdose among people who inject drugs in Tijuana, Mexico. I am presenting this on uh, behalf of the person who really led this work, uh, Javier Cepeda, who's at Johns Hopkins University, um, as well as uh, a doctoral student that I have, Carlos Rivera, who worked on the hepatitis C bit, um, and other colleagues here at UC San Diego. And here are my disclosures. So today I'll be talking about structural interventions to prevent HIV, hepatitis C virus, and overdose among people who inject drugs. Structural interventions change the environment in which people act in order to influence their health behaviors. And so specifically today we'll be considering laws and law enforcement practices. And we will examine how a police education program can change policing behavior and positively impact and reshape the risk environment for people who inject drugs. So recognizing that the war on drugs had failed, in 2009, Mexico implemented a series of narcomenudeo reforms. 
These reforms included provisions to decriminalize small amounts of drugs, um, the thresholds for select drugs shown here on the right-hand side of this slide. Additionally, on the third apprehension of an individual with uh, drug amounts below this threshold, the laws recommended referral to drug treatment. Now, unfortunately, they did not specify exactly what type of drug treatment to provide, and I'll get back to that in, the moment, in a moment. So the study where we evaluated the impact of these reforms is, uh, is in Tijuana, Mexico. Tijuana is a major border city of the US and Mexico. It lies on the border of California and Baja, uh, Mexico in the red box that you can see here. And it is 30 kilometers south of downtown San Diego. So a really contiguous uh, border town. Tijuana is a nexus for trafficking illicit drugs into the United States and has approximately 10,000 people who inject drugs who reside there. There's a high infectious disease burden with over 90% of people who inject drugs in Tijuana showing evidence of exposure to hepatitis C, 4% um, with evidence of HIV virus, and minimal access to harm reduction services, uh, as well as minimal access to treatment. Additionally, abusive policing practices are pervasive and well-documented, as you can see here on the right. And these uh, practices do contribute to risk among people who inject drugs. So uh, our study of uh, uh, people who inject drugs in Tijuana showed increased recept receptive syringe sharing was associated with exposure to incarceration, syringe confiscation by the police, and other policing um, interactions. Our local work is supported by uh, global systematic reviews, in including one done by Jack Stone, showing that incarceration is associated with HIV and hepatitis C acquisition, as well as its known associations with a fetal overdose. So what happened in Tijuana after these reforms? Well, unfortunately, they uh, there was little uh, change in the experience uh, with people who inject drugs. They reported no changes in incarceration. There was negligible access before and after the reforms to evidence-based opiate agonist therapy. And unfortunately, what happened was that the government funded non-evidence-based compulsory abstinence programs. These programs effectively act as prisons. They've been associated with increased risk of overdose and receptive syringe sharing among people who inject drugs in Tijuana, and they're extremely dangerous. Furthermore, um, there, there were minor um, improvements reported in policing exposure and police harassment. Uh, people who inject drugs did report a decline in recent exposure to syringe confiscation, so that's past six months um, by the police uh, from 10% to 1% after the reforms, or to about 0% after the reforms. So why didn't anything really change? Well, the main thing was that there was little knowledge about the reform among the Tijuana police. So in 2015, several years after the, the drug reforms, less than 10% correctly identified the heroin possession threshold, only half recognized syringes to be legal as they always had been. And for those that did know about the reforms, they typically just identified mass media as their source of information. And they often cited um, conflicts between the national reforms and local laws. And they said they weren't given any operating procedures in order to actually implement the reforms locally. So a modeling study performed by Anik Borges and published in the Lancet Public Health in 2018 looked at the potential impact that these drug law reforms had had on HIV among people who inject drugs. And she found that the limited reform um, had resulted in limited HIV impact, so averting potentially 5% of infections from 2018 to 2030 as they had been implemented. She also uh, assessed that government funding of the compulsory abstinence programs could actually have caused harm and um, increased HIV infections, which is what you're seeing in the middle bar here. But if implemented properly with reductions in incarceration and diversion to opiate agonist therapy that's evidence-based, um, these reforms could avert 21% of new HIV infections from 2018 to 2030. And so this was really showing the potential benefits of properly implemented reform. So, um, so 
The, this was followed by the development of a police education program, which was entitled Escudo or Shield in English. It was a NIDA funded study. It was led by Leo Beletsky and Stephanie Strathdy, and the aim was to align policing with public health in Tijuana. Just over 1,800 police officers, the entire police force in Tijuana were trained over a one-year period um, using a step wedge design from 2015 to 2016. A subsample of those officers were followed prospectively um, for two years to evaluate changes in their um, attitudes, education, as well as their behaviors related to interactions with people who inject drugs. And we also then were able to follow a longitudinal cohort of people who inject drugs and interview them to track their self-reported um, interactions with police. So a little bit more about the intervention. Well, it was a partnership with the Tijuana Police Academy and they used a train the trainer model. So senior police officers were trained and they delivered the training to junior officers. And it was culturally adapted by the instructors. It incorporated three modules. The first was on basic epidemiology, HIV, viral hepatitis, tuberculosis. The second module discussed relevant national and state drug policies and the drug reforms. And the third module included ele general elements of harm reduction and just public health principles. So our aim for this study was to evaluate the impact and the cost effectiveness of Escudo on preventing HIV, hepatitis C, and fatal overdose among people who inject drugs in Tijuana. The first thing we did was we tried to triangulate um, evidence of impact, both among the police officers as well as people who inject drugs. And what we found is that police officers reported reductions in frequencies of making arrests for syringe possession, as well as arrests for heroin possession um, uh, in the two years after the training compared to before the training. So not only was there an impact, um, before and after the training, but it was sustained in the two-year period that the police officers were followed up. We also looked at self-reported exposure to incarceration among people who inject drugs in Tijuana. So this slide shows the proportion reporting incarceration in the past six months from 2011 all the way out to 2020. So the green area shows the pre-training period before the intervention. The yellow period shows the uh, training, the intervention period as the uh, police officers were progressively trained. And then the two periods on the right were classified as post-training with the blue period, the two-year period that the officers were also in active follow-up. And the right, the very far right-hand period showing the period where we were only following people who inject drugs for their exposures, but no longer following the police. And what you can see here was that there was a substantial decline in exposure to incarceration, which uh, coincided with the onset of the training. And we continued through the post-training period. And our analyses indicate that 65%, individuals were 68% less likely to have been incarcerated in the post-training period compared to the pre-training period. Now, to evaluate the population impact of cost effectiveness, we used and adapted a published dynamic HIV transmission and overdose model among people who inject drugs. That model was calibrated to HIV prevalence, incidence, and incarceration data in Tijuana, Mexico. We simulated the intervention using um, our evidence of observed declines in incarceration among people who inject drugs uh, after a SCUDO, that 68% reduction for two years, which was the observed impact period um, where we were following both the police as well as people who inject drugs. We also looked at a scenario simulating uh, hypothetical impacts that sustained for 10 years, and we compared those to a counterfactual of no incarceration changes with no intervention. The outcomes that we looked at were HIV incidence and fatal overdose. We additionally looked at um, the cost effectiveness, and so we incorporated the cost of the intervention, which we obtained through micro-costing methods. The intervention costed $129 per officer trained, and in the model, we included both the cost of incarceration as well as ART. For the cost effectiveness evaluation, we used just that two-year intervention effect because that was the time where we could uh, monitor the impact among police as well as people who inject drugs, and we use a 50-year time horizon. We track the costs in U.S. dollars and the health utilities and disability-adjusted life years, um, and we calculate an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, or an ICER. We compare that ICER to the willingness to pay threshold of a uh, to a willingness to pay threshold of the per capita GDP in Mexico, which is just over $8,000. 
We performed two um, important sensitivity analysis that I'll discuss today. One was where we examined the additional impact the intervention could have had on hepatitis C virus using a separate dynamic transmission model that was developed by Carlos Rivera. And we also assessed the cost effectiveness if the intervention was developed and implemented by local investigators. So this is the result that we found for the impact. And so we found that 1% of new HIV infections and 9% of fatal overdoses could have been averted over the two-year period of Escudo. And that effect could increase to 3% of HIV infections averted and 14% of fatal overdoses over a 10-year intervention period. Now, if we look at the two-year intervention costs um, with Escudo, which is on the right-hand side, or with no Escudo, which is on the left-hand side, what we can see is that without the intervention, the majority of costs are due to incarceration of people who inject drugs, which are in blue, as well as um, ART costs in orange. Now, the intervention cost, which is on the right-hand side in gray, is offset by reductions in the cost of incarceration, shown here in blue, um, resulting in roughly the same amount of costs over the two years. Overall, the intervention was cost-effective at a mean cost-effectiveness ratio of 6,800 per daily averted, which was below our willingness to pay threshold. Now, when we also additionally look at the potential impact on hepatitis C virus, we um, assessed that 4% of hepatitis C infections could be averted over 10 years, and that the intervention was even more cost-effective if this was included. And finally, in consideration of the fact that this intervention could be developed and implemented by local investigators if implemented in other areas in Mexico, our sensitivity analysis using those local costs indicated that the intervention could actually be cost-saving um, if developed by local investigators. In conclusion, our work um, you know, really supports the idea that laws and policies that criminalize drug use are key drivers of HIV and hepatitis C and overdose risk among people who inject drugs. In Tijuana, unfortunately, drug law reforms were insufficient alone to change the lived experience of people who used drugs. But promisingly, we saw that a decline of incarceration coincided with the implementation of a public health-oriented police education intervention, although we require more evidence for causality and we cannot you know, uh, necessarily assume that all of that impact was causally associated to the intervention program. We believe that may be true because of the triangulation of data, but we really need more evidence to, to show that that is the case. Nevertheless, our, indicate, our analysis indicates that training the police on public health principles is likely cost-effective in Mexico and could be an important structural intervention to improve PWID health. And I would just like to thank again and acknowledge the collaborators on this work, as well as the co-investigators and study participants in the sites and the many grants that funded these and other studies. Thank you. It's time for morning tea. Enjoy. Thank you all very much.